no, no, this person needs to stay on this for it's a like bit longer. like the Botox is working. The Botox is working. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, oh, you fell off the criteria. You don't meet it now. It seems like, oh, they're being a bit slow or something. But actually, they've got the early stages of a migraine attack. I didn't know that was a trigger for people. But yeah, when I found it, I was like, amazing. wow. So what is the classification that makes migraine chronic versus... I don't know, is there, is there, can you, I don't want to say casually experience a migraine, but you, yeah. know, you know what I mean. What are the boundaries there? People don't actually want to do it. Today is all about migraines and we're going to talk about Amy. So <laughs> I think the best place to start is, Amy, tell us how your journey in migraine started. So, well, thank you, first of all, for having me and for that lovely introduction. Um... I started, I feel like, with migraine very untraditionally. So I didn't have migraine attacks growing up. I never fitted the kind of episodic, I shouldn't do that really, it's episodic migraine, but the episodic migraine criteria. I kind of retrospectively realised I was quite a headachey teenager and I had a few periods of about a couple of weeks at a time with a constant headache and they were both what I would now call like let down headaches um, after a period of stress. So I had it once in my sick form and then again another time at university just after I handed in my dissertation, which now I understand headache, I understand my body and my brain and how crucially my brain responds to stress. I'm like, oh, of course I did. But it wasn't a debilitating headache. It certainly didn't fit any criteria for migraine. And it went away on its own after a couple of weeks. I had one migraine attack the summer before I became chronic, and this was very different. I worked at Wimbledon um, tennis during my summer holidays whilst at university, and on the last day I got what I now know is an extreme visual aura, which again isn't typical because none of my migraine attacks since have had visual aura, which I still find like fascinating and always want to talk to headache specialists about like how can that be. Um, such as the complexities of migraine. And over the period of about two hours, I slowly lost all vision. Um, it started with me kind of looking up at screens on um, the suite I was working in and had a TV and being like, does the TV look funny? Like, are the lights going a bit strange? Um, luckily, I got back to my home station just about when I had about five ten percent vision left I had to get a taxi home like a five ten minute walk because I physically couldn't walk got to bed had a pounding headache took some paracetamol slept for a few hours woke up groggy but fine didn't think anything more about it didn't even really wouldn't have called it a migraine attack I don't think back then and then skip forward how many months? Seven, eight months the following January, I woke up on the 2nd of January 2015 with a headache. Again, not debilitating. Kind of thought it was a bit of a delayed New Year's Eve <laughs> hangover, <laughs> was a bit tired. Um, and from that day forward, I had head pain every day for around seven years. It did not go away. And over the course of the next month or two, really, January, February, I was still working, trying to travel into the city and London and things and just feeling worse and worse. It still wasn't migraine-like, if if you like, um, but it was constant. And after three or four weeks with a constant headache, it's suddenly like, this is, something's not quite right here. Um, and it wasn't until a few months later that I was actually diagnosed with chronic migraine. And by that point, I not only had this daily constant 24-7 oh, head pain, I was having increasing amounts of what I now know migraine attacks, which were very severe, very debilitating. I was having other symptoms as well, light and noise sensitivity, um, and went from pretty much it felt overnight being normal, normal, whatever normal is, healthy, working, you know, able to do everything, go see my friends, play sport, to in bed, unable to move most of the time. And also really scared at that point because I had no idea what migraine was. I hadn't grown up with it. I didn't know how to manage attacks. Um, and I really, I say like was thrown in at the deep end because I, I didn't know anything. And especially in those first few months, I was also worried, was there something more sinister going on in my brain? Um, and I think didn't really, when I was diagnosed with migraine, still myself kind of felt that was almost a bit dismissive. Like it can't just be migraine. I had that stigma attached to it myself because I'm like, 
you don't get it. <laughs> it's not some bad headaches. It's really, really bad. Um, and now I know just how bad chronic migraine can be. Damn. <laughs> just damn. I, I, I just just hear it like, do you know the, the visual aura stuff? Yeah. I, I get that with my migraines. I, I'm very, like, I'm very rare, but me and T, like, T see me go for, like, a minor migraine. It's normally from stress. I normally get it when yeah. I'm, like, overwhelmed. Always stress. And it's, like, it's it's the blurriness in your vision. Like, you're you're trying to look at something, and all you can see is your peripheral vision is just blurry. Yeah. And then you're, like, you can't focus on anything. Like, it's like you're working around, like, in, I would say, like, swimming in water. And that's the way I kind of, like, refer to yeah. it. But, like, to go through that, like, and not understand what it is and be in bed when you're fit and healthy all the time is just must have been quite a scary place to be. Aura can be really scary and only about 30% of attacks have aura. Loads of people think, oh, I don't fit the criteria for migraine because I don't have aura. You probably do. You just mm. don't have migraine with aura. Um, and they can present so differently. Like, I've spoken to so many people with migraine now from all over the world. Visual auras can look incredibly different. So you might experience this kind of water, <laughs> underwater sensation. Other people have stars or um, spirals or they'll just, like, lose half of their vision. Um, but the thing with aura, now we're talking about it, I always want to highlight is it doesn't have to be visual and so many people actually experience other sensory disturbances and again are like well it can't be migraine because I haven't lost my vision but you can get numbness you can get tingling any kind of main sensory disturbance before the main attack is actually classed as migraine with aura. Sorry can you explain that to me um so you're saying that if kind of anywhere in your body if you're having some sort of a sensory um kind of attack or something something different happening and then that is followed by kind of a classic migraine or because as someone who doesn't um very luckily uh, doesn't suffer from migraines I think my assumption when you hear the word migraine is like oh it's just a bad headache yeah um and you kind of think of okay tension pain around the head area but obviously from kind of talking to you and and you and like talking more about migraine I realize that's absolutely <laughs> not the the reality um so for anyone that might be listening to this um kind of coming maybe from my perspective that wouldn't be as familiar you're saying that that's how it's diagnosed so the kind of sensation pre a classic migraine or could there is there no such thing really as a, a classic migraine in that sense of of what a lot of us might think mm -hmm. does that make sense it does Am make I? sense <laughs> so the easiest way to answer this is really to talk about an attack the attack stages yeah so most people like what you're saying about think about the bad head pain and that's what we in the migraine space we'll talk about as the main attack which is okay. actually phase three if you're talking about migraine with aura so there are three key stages of a migraine attack without aura the premonitory phase the main attack phase and the post phase. And if you're talking about migraine with aura, you put the aura stage in between the premonitory and the main attack. Okay. So the easiest way to explain it is just to talk you through what that would look like. Yeah, so the premonitory do. phase is the early warning signs that a migraine attack is underway. And one of the biggest learning curves, I think, for most people with migraine is they don't recognize these early warning signs. And these are key they're so important for people to recognize in order to actually get on top of attacks because they wait until they've got throbbing head pain and they're throwing up until they're doing anything about it so the premonitory symptoms can actually occur days before the main attack or they might occur a few hours before these tend to be things like fatigue stiff neck if you wake up and you're like oh I've slept funny it's probably and you have migraines it's probably a migraine attacks on, on the way um change in mood yawning that was a big one for me if you're suddenly yawning loads and you're not actually tired and it's like excessive yawning um chocolate cravings, cravings. yeah cravings is always a chocolate craving because you're not a massive chocolate person but oh, like, then it's it was never clear yeah. for me because i'm like well i'm always craving uh, chocolate <laughs> I, know. I know the minute dilly's like oh i'm kind of craving chocolate i'm like it's on the way. Yeah. <laughs> and also this is the chocolate whilst we're talking about it is this is why so many people think that chocolate is a trigger for them because they start craving it and they eat it and then they get what they know is their main migraine attack. And 
it's probably not a trigger, yeah. it's a craving. Um, so that's always an interesting one. Frequency for urination, like if you're constantly going to the toilet a lot and you're not normally and you're well hydrated, um, they're all the kind of early warning signs. They can look very different, but I would say recognizing your own ones is really important. Um, the second would then be an aura stage. This tends to be shorter. It's normally kind of from minutes to a couple of hours max. Um, and so it can be visual, but it could be something like numbness. There are different types of migraine. You, some people get numbness, um, hemiplegic and tingling, lose, um, what's sensation. the word? Yeah, sensation down one side of the body and actually become paralyzed. Some people down one side of the body, it presents a lot like stroke, but that's kind of in the premonitory aura stage and there is some overlap in symptoms between them. And then is the main attack, which is, what you would think of as a migraine Classic. tends to be um, throbbing head pain. People sometimes describe it as head pick pain. It's usually one sided, but actually it can be both sides. It can be around the back. It can be at the front um, and it can switch. So a lot of people who have frequent migraine attacks will tell you, if you use myself as an example, I typically had right side migraine attacks. And if I got a left one, oh, I knew I was in trouble because they would always give me <laughs> a lot more nausea. Um, so it's, it's very odd how it can move around. Mm. And then the fourth stage is the post stage. And this is more commonly referred to as the migraine hangover. Mm. So let me get the chocolate back out. Mm. <laughs> and this is kind of where people feel sluggish. They've had this horrible few days, week, however long it's gone on for attack and this is where people feel like because the head pain and their kind of main debilitating symptoms are over that they need to get straight back to work straight back to being productive you know family life everything else and actually when you look at the impact of migraine on people's life and their pro productivity especially in the workplace people tend to still be affected during this time and I think people give themselves a really hard time about it but there's a reason for this. You are still in the migraine attack. It's just at the later phase. Um, and then for people who have chronic migraine and frequent attacks, there's also a phase called the interictal phase, which is the phase in between attacks. And this is for people like myself who actually had <laughs> symptoms daily outside of attacks. It's kind of just another way of classing these symptoms, really. So some people will have three main stages if you don't have a clear aura some people will have four with aura and people who are either high frequency episodic or they fit the criteria for chronic migraine might also have some um, interictal symptoms or symptoms in between attacks can you can you get sick leave if uh, with, with migraine it's area? really a gray area still mm, it yeah. is classed as a disability um, unfortunately the reality when I hear from people weekly, sadly still, about their struggles at work, um, is even when they have disclosed everything. And people are scared to disclose migraine at work 100%. as well. It's a, yeah. it's a huge secret thing. I am of the mindset that it should be disclosed and it should. you cannot get the help you need and the support you need at work if you are keeping it a secret. It's only going to get worse and worse. I know not everyone agrees with that and tries to battle on, but I just think how on earth can your workplace even attempt to support you? And quite frankly, if you're in a workplace that aren't supporting you or making you feel terrible, then it's probably not the workplace for you. People have certain arrangements at work, um, but I, I hear a lot of people who have very stress where then, you know, they've used up all their sick days and is there any other allowance or they make some different work from home arrangements. Often the work from home arrangement that workplaces give people, I think kind of gets a bit misconstrued because they think, well, you know, if you're not feeling good today, you can work from home. Where in the reality is if someone's having a migraine attack and they're debilitated and unable to work, working from home might make them more comfortable, but they can't actually work from home a lot of the time. Or they might be able to do a few hours, you know, in the early stages or in the post home stage, but they actually can't doesn't solve the issue it's they need yeah. time off because they're debilitated <laughs> with working in pyjama bottoms yeah, it's isn't not, going that's to that's not like the help. vibe and yeah. I actually I think it gives the work from home it makes you look bad, it, like, look bad yeah. as if we're all just yeah. like sitting there yeah. um, it's a break. so yeah. I, it's very different between different sectors okay. some people I hear have wonderful support and you know managers who understand and accommodations in place you know they've got different lighting they've got different work setups they do have a flexible work home balance which can be helpful during certain mm. 
stages. Um, but I also hear, sadly, from a lot of, especially um, in the healthcare sector, nurses, doctors, midwives, um, and also teachers, who it's very difficult environment to be in when you're living with migraine and actually they are not getting the support anywhere near the support that they need to to manage their migraine I actually still have a, I remember one of my teachers Mr. Here I remember when I went to his I think I got told off for something obviously because it's dilly you're gonna get told <laughs> for something right and I remember getting sent to his like office and he was sat with his lights off blinds closed window open and I remember walking go what the hell have I walked into? And him, him saying, oh, I've got a migraine, so please just bear with me. Yeah. And I, now now you understand why like people in like careers like teachers and stuff, how are you meant to say to your classes, sorry, I can't take class today because I've got a migraine? Yeah. But anything that you even need to kind of, you know, talk or engage, because I can't imagine having, you know, not just the classic symptoms, but any of those symptoms that you, you mentioned and then having to kind of like make eye contact and yeah. engage and you know that that must just be so difficult and your speech that's a big thing we, we haven't spoken about but mm. your speech can be affected finding words I have people who message me saying you know they have a presentation that day or they've got a big meeting and they don't want to look silly or stupid in front of their colleagues and it it seems like oh they're being a bit slow or something but actually they've got the early stages of a migraine attack and then you know the stress of that can they even make it worse and bring on symptoms and all of the above. So it's, it's not a fun time managing a, migraine at work. Yeah, it's a bit of a cycle. Before we move on, I just wanted to circle back to, oh, so you were chronic. talking about the stages of, of migraine. So what is the classification that makes migraine chronic versus, I don't know, is, the, is there, can you, I don't want to say casually experience a migraine, but you, yeah. know, you know what I mean. What are the boundaries there? So I personally think the diagnostic wording is terrible because the chronic migraine sounds like I've had migraine for years right anything else we use chronic for it just mm. sounds like oh it's gone on for a while so if you tell people you have chronic migraine it sounds like oh I've grown up with migraine I've had or maybe I've had them a lot and I make it my mission anyone I tell I've had chronic migraine to to explain what this actually means so if you have chronic migraine you have got to have 15 or more headache days per month of at least of which at least eight are migrainous in nature so you're having around eight or more migraine attacks per month and this has got to have happened over a three-month period so you can't just have like a one-off bad month and it's also got to be in the absence of um, what's called medication it was previously called medication overuse headache we're trying to talk more about medication yeah. ad adaptation headache now um, which basically means you're using pain medication too frequently episodic migraine which can be anything from you've had one migraine attack in your life or it could be you're having three or four attacks a month the actual criteria is anything less than 15 headache days a month so it's like that's the the border it's on but it's usually just spoken around you might have yeah, one attack a year or seven attacks in a month, but anything less than 15 headache days a month and the eight, that's like the criteria between episodic and chronic. Okay. So okay. basically you need to suffer for 90 days for us to even deal with you. Yeah. That's, ba that's basically what they're saying, isn't it? It's like, it's like you can't take medication and if you not suffer for at least 90 days, then what's anyone handle it? It's quite unusual to go, it's not unheard of because I did it and I've spoken to lots of other people, but most people, the natural mm. progression is to have, have episodic migraine attacks and gradually get more frequent into what's known as like high frequency episodic which yeah. sits below which is also a uh, group of migraine people with migraine who actually I think get forgotten about because they're not meeting the chronic criteria they're underneath it but they still might be having but that's what I mean an that, attack or two I mean. a week yeah. and it's yeah. like they're I mean. really struggling they're a group mm. where I'm like you're not having daily pain and symptoms or more symptoms a month than not more days of symptoms than not mm. but like let's help these people now before it gets that way because um, realistically it's probably just you know that red line in terms of when you're coming up with diagnostic yeah. criteria for anything yeah you have to draw a line somewhere so it's but then kind the people of have dropped off that's the problem it's yeah that, it's that line because even when I spoke to Andy about it and Andy was just like when they were doing the um, injections into the back of the neck. I forgot what it's called now. Is it the, um, the Botox? Oh, Botox. No. Yeah. Oh, Botox. yeah, the Botox injections. And he was saying if you met the criteria, 
but then you fell off the criteria. Like if you yeah. like if you're if you're migrant down, then they'd be like, oh, you don't need him anymore. And mm. Andy would be like, no, no, this person needs to stay on this for it's a like bit the longer. The Botox is working. The Botox is working. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, oh, you fell off the criteria. You don't meet it now. So like, it, like what sort of oh, jackassery is that? Sorry. So if you're that's really receiving common, yeah. treatment and then. Surely that's an indication the treatment is working and you should be put on the treatment plan. It's changed a bit. So with Botox... <laughs> no, this is really interesting. It's all about the money. Botox, am, am I wrong there? It's no, about the, it's all about the money, isn't it? So Most headache specialist nurses yeah. now and this is the, the candid truth of it, yeah. will warn patients of this beforehand because if you if you improve too much, if the treatment's worked too, too well, well, which is what you want. Yeah. <laughs> you want this. You do not fit the criteria because you have yeah. to have chronic migraine to have Botox to yeah. meet it. I think things are starting to change a little bit in the right direction. I think it's it's still too rigid. With the newer drugs, the anti-CGRP drugs, there's issues with enforced breaks when people are doing too well. But there isn't the same rigidity with the um if you've improved too well that you're not chucked off it straight away and there are some people this is like me supporting the botox now who actually do stop it after they've mm. reduced chronic and they still maintain it without the botox so mm. and that we see across different treatments it's not always that mm. by coming off it, it's not but for most people especially if you've done let's say like six months of botox and you've gone from 20 attack days a month down to 10 or yeah. 7 or something and you're doing much better to suddenly lose Botox is terrifying and I mm. think the fear of that actually does more harm sometimes than losing the Botox itself trigger the, it could trigger the stress and everything because yeah. you think about it right you're you finally get better but you've been off work for ages mm. and then you can't afford to then pay for the Botox out privately and then you're basically you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't and then you get people who are just like right I'll just have to lie. Yeah, people they will, do. People oh, will just lie when, because they have to lie to get it. And that's that, and that, imagine doing that. You have to lie to get the treatment that you need. But this is, I mean, I think this is highlights very clearly a cycle that happens in all types of chronic illness. Um, you know, at least here in the UK that I'm aware of, but I think probably in a lot of places because I used to be on the, um, I've, I was diagnosed with EDS and I went down the nerve pain clinical route for a long time. And it's really interesting listening to you because it really is quite similar in terms of that cycle of something could be working. But if you then get too well, all of a sudden, all of the supports that you mm. had, had to fight, you had to fight for in order to get initially are taken away and then that can fall off. And I think often there isn't enough support on, you know, all of the other treatments. I think sometimes, you know, say with Botox, and I want to ask you more about that with regards to migraine, but say Botox is this treatment protocol that you've been put on and it's working really well and then it's working too well, so you're taken off it. How much support has been given while you're taking the Botox to look at all of the other factors in your life that could be contributing or is it that we've just been focusing on this one thing, then, you know, it's worked, you're ta it's taken away from you. But because you've been on this trajectory of chronic illness, maybe you've had to reduce your hours at work. Maybe you've had to take, you know, step away from work. Then you're in a position maybe that you're not as financially stable. If this treatment is taken away from you publicly, can you afford it privately? Botox privately is incredibly expensive, particularly from a medicinal sense because you often need higher doses mm. you know I think it becomes this cycle so then you could be taken off it and then very quickly fall back into the criteria which is such a shame because it just you know it becomes this thing so um, and by the time you need it again you, you meet the criteria there's probably a waiting list yes. of however long so you just suffer again most people who I actually hear about this issue less and less, which kind of fuels me with hope that things yeah. are changing in the right direction. But most people as well have no idea until they're suddenly, you know, they're having their review appointment and it's like, oh, you you don't fit the criteria anymore. Like, I'm not going to be able to get the, they, you know, they have to apply for funding each time from the commissioning board mm -hmm. or I can't remember who it is. I think it's like the CCG to allow you to have Botox again. And it's, it's tick boxes. Like, you don't meet this criteria. So you wouldn't even know to answer slightly differently to these questions um and then like you say they then just kind of get booted out and 
when you were talking about are they being prepared in other ways are they looking whilst Botox is working how else can we educate this patient I think that's non-existent I was fortunate enough to see some of the best headache specialists like really great headache specialist clinics in London and the only reason that anything else was ever really discussed I would say was because I would bring it up because I was already in in the like early days of like well I need to educate myself I'm going to talk about supplements I'm going to talk about this and that was in really good lengthy appointments with headache specialists most people aren't seeing them most people are seeing their GP who doesn't don't even have the education um yet there are so many other options outside of just do the Botox do the injections take this Mm -hmm. medication um, so yeah, I think there's a huge gap, sadly. Yeah. And also even just all the energy that that level of self advocacy takes when you are struggling and you are in pain. Yeah. Um, I think the fact that that is the requirement essentially in order to get onto a trajectory where you can regain your, um, you know, your life really and mm-hmm. your kind of like your stability and things is is really sad because as you say, those are in the best circumstances, best yeah. clinics, best specialists, which a lot of people don't have access to. So again, you're kind of falling into this. And even with that, often you can yeah. still fall into that cycle. So can we talk a little bit more about some of the um, triggers that you've, kind of learnt about or maybe that you've spoken about with headache specialists because you mentioned stress being a trigger um you mentioned even chocolate sometimes mistakenly being being called a trigger um but I think I know from speaking to people who have migraines stress is always one that come up but there must be other other things what are the most common triggers that you see with migraine sufferers is there common threads throughout could it be a wide variety of things what what kind of goes on there your partner <laughs> <laughs> you're giving me a much no. <laughs> um so there are so many but they're very personal and this okay. is again like a big misconception people have because when i first was diagnosed i'm like googling what migraine triggers are and like trying to avoid everything it's kind of a waste of time because my triggers will probably look very different from Dilly's triggers, even though it seems both of us um, stress is a big one. So the common ones are, I know we kind of talked about cho- chocolate, but food triggers do exist. They weren't something for me, but for some people, cheese. they are a thing. Mm. All sorts of things. Yeah. Like there's all the classics like chocolate, cheese, alcohol, mm. um, caffeine, but there's also some really weird ones. Imagine like, a lot of additives and like some of the like colorings and preservatives. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. Smells? Perfume smells. Yeah, and stuff smells as well. again. That's one that can be both. So it okay. can be a premonitory um, symptom that people have a hypersensitivity to certain smells, and they actually okay. already have a migraine attack, and they're like, "Oh, I can't stand that perfume." But also, some smells do trigger. Um, hormones are a big trigger. So people who get menstrual related um, migraine attacks, the weather. Lots of people struggle in all sorts of weather. Sunny weather, changes in pressure rainy weather like we have outside Mm. um wind wind was a really big trigger for me if I was like outside on a windy day without a hat on it would like seem to set off a migraine attack for me would that be kind of temperature related or pressure pressure. or there's not there's there's, um there's there's research around like as pressure changes in the atmosphere yeah barometric pressure pressure, it triggers migraines I, I I did I did um I did a post about it actually recently about about, about barometric pressure. I I didn't know that was a trigger for people. But when I found it, I was like, wow. People even move, um, especially some people I know in the States have moved um, because if they're in an area where the pressure changes a lot, where it suddenly drops and rises, it's like too much for them. So they've Mm. actually moved to a state where things are calmer. Um, Stress can be a big one. I'm trying to think what other ones we've missed. Travel is a big one, but that's usually because it combines a lot of other triggers. So changes in routine lack of sleep is a big one um senior or in-laws. Poor quality sleep <laughs> <laughs> I'm, joking. I'm joking basically I'm joking. so much sorry sorry i'm joking i'm joking so That's much a joke. That's of a joke. daily life can be a trigger for people yeah. yeah um but there's all sorts of weird ones as well like um travel in terms of just car journeys so the mm. motion i used to get a lot of motion sickness when i um was very severely chronic like short journeys even would trigger off attacks for me mm. um 
but they can change and that's the other misconception people think that their triggers are fixed and that's it forever but actually most of the triggers I had when I was chronic are no longer triggers for me anymore so like there is hope if you're watching this and you've got all these triggers and you're like oh but I can't do anything about them they they can change and um that you're not stuck with them forever mm. I think like it's the same with like the histamine community we talk a lot about it like yeah. what triggers you isn't going to be like it's this weird obsession with like a tick box exercise yeah. like i feel like literally people go have you got this list for this and it's like no like chill like you need to keep a diary and identify what's for you like yeah. you like just how we like to be like we dress individually how we eat individually our taste of individual our triggers are individual as well. And for some reason, I, and I, I do think it's because allopathic medicine has to go through this tick box exercise mm -hmm. that we go through it, that we think we if we have that, then we must have it. So I would say to people, you need to just identify it yourself, but we're not given that chance because you imagine going to an appointment and saying, well, this is what triggers me. Well, sorry, it's not on the list. Yeah. And it's true, isn't it? It's like, it's not on the list, is it? Yeah. So you can't, it, it can't be true. But I think it, it can become quite a source of anxiety as well when you're kind of trying to monitor all your triggers, but also then preempt your triggers yeah. and kind of think, oh, I can't do this because this could happen, this could happen, this could happen. Or, oh, I have this trip or, you know, I want to go out for a meal with my friends or my family, but I need to think about all of these different 10 things. Mm. But then on the flip side, I think often, you know, in order to be heard and taken seriously, um, when you're going to see your doctor and you're feeling unwell, you equally have to have these trigger points because that's the criteria that they work within. So I can I can see that kind of balance being quite tricky. And then also in the recovery space, you know, you, you're you conscious of these triggers, but I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, so I'd be interested to hear your perspective, but when you're trying to heal and recover um, in a chronic space, I, I imagine that fixation and focus on all the different triggers isn't very useful long-term mm -hmm. either. So it's almost mm -hmm. like having to soften or let go of some of the things that brought you to the diagnosis in the first place. Is that something that you would... Yeah, there's there's two things. First, I'm actually going to talk about what Dilly said because with triggers as well, the other misconception, and we are kind of only really just started talking about this, I feel like, in the migraine space over the last few years with triggers, is that mm. it's always just this one thing that set off a migraine attack. And now we kind of know or we think more likely that it's this buildup of triggers and it's actually called um, migraine threshold theory and it's that we sit, we all have a different threshold, people with migraine and if I'm chronic, mine might be a lot lower and it needs almost if you think of a cup of water building up and each bit of water is a different trigger. If you have chronic migraine, you probably don't need a lot of triggers added to your cup to meet your threshold mm. where the water is overflowing at the top and you have a migraine attack. Mm. Whereas if you have episodic migraine, it might be a buildup. Yet so many people will blame a specific trigger. So they might have a coffee in the afternoon and they get a migraine attack and they're like, oh, I can't drink coffee. Coffee is a trigger for me. Whereas in reality... They had a fight with their partner the night before because they were being rude about the in-laws. <laughs> and then, then they had a bad night's sleep because yeah. they've got a young child and yeah. disturbed. And yeah. then they skipped breakfast on the way in because they didn't have time for that. Mm. And then they had a really stressful podcast with someone and it went, <laughs> you know, like something happened. And then they had the cup of coffee and people are really bad, I think, at looking sometimes at the bigger picture, which kind of gets on to your point about hyperfixation. In my early years, I was so fixated on I have to find my triggers and I speak to so many people not quite daily but on a weekly basis who are like I just need to work out what my triggers are and then I'll be better yes there are some triggers especially food ones where it's like it's a really easy cutout if you find that there's something that every single time you eat this food or you have this drink you get a migraine attack fine cut it out it's actually really easy I used to wish I had food triggers because I'm <laughs> like I'd give up anything right but these other ones I now sit on the side of people focus so much. They are so laser focused and actually they end up in this awful cycle of avoidance and they're cutting out more and more of their life and their world is getting smaller and smaller yep. and they're not getting any better. Yeah. I was at a point mm -hmm. where I was like, every single thing I do 
gives me a migraine attack, right? Like I take a shower, get a migraine attack, blow dry my hair, get a migraine attack, rest all day, get a migraine attack, go outside, like everything. And I'm like, these can't all be my triggers. It's just where my brain is sat. I'm so highly sensitized that like my bod- my brain is interpreting everything as a trigger and is dangerous. And like, how do we calm that down? Mm. And it's it's kind of, I'm getting better, I think, at speaking about this online, but a lot of um, doctors still and other people, you know, advocating still sit very much on like, you just need to identify your triggers and remove them. And I think this is helpful advice for people more in the episodic space and mm-hmm. recognizing, you know, it's good to recognize stress as a trigger. It's good to recognize the importance of good quality sleep and look at what else is going on. But if you're having frequent attacks and you are spending your days, like, I think that fear of triggers is actually more triggering than the trigger itself. One thousand percent. I was literally one hundred. I was like, "This is the this is the." We spend too much time. We together. yeah, we spend way too much time together. This I cannot. You, you I wasn't sure if that, that was a woo or a boo. No. That was like a woo. That's like no. a that's a that's a that's a that's a, that's a triple old damn. Yeah. That is, man. That's real but you, I just I feel like the way you say things is just, and it's something that reflects in your um in your Instagram page around migraine. Mm. You have a way of saying things that that just kind of really builds the connection and in in a really simple way Mm. because it's that kind of as you say in the early stage it can be helpful but then it can almost become something that's debilitating in itself and particularly I think about you know both of you who said stress can be um, a trigger and I, I know in a lot of chronic spaces stress is a trigger and then like it's not very helpful to be told well stress is a trigger so just be less stressed whereas you're like you have all of these things yeah. you're saying you can't even have a shower without having a migraine yeah. and it's like I'll just what be less stressed <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what are you supposed to do with yeah. that like that's not helpful it might be accurate to an extent but it's yeah. not helpful so please help me <laughs> it's like you know you know when, like, even, like, when like couples hate each other like they go for a bad phase and like just like calm down you know when someone tells you to calm down and like <laughs> Oh, I will I will punch you in the face and then I'll calm down. So like anyone anyone who's watching this right now, if your partner tells you to calm down, yeah, like there's two words and the second one's off yeah. <laughs> because you need to just leave me leave me be. Like it, the thing it's is, it's a bit dismissive, isn't it? Yeah, it's 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 a, it's a dismissive way of like dealing with it. But it's like you said, when we're if we become obsessed with the triggers, you're not trying to treat it. You're trying to prevent something that with migraine can happen for various reasons Mm -hmm. and you're actually creating another added layer of stress and the fact that we're being told to look at triggers and remove it and I have the exact same argument with so many people in the histamine community and but when I say it's an unpopular opinion but it's not unpopular because listen in the nice way possible bro if that was working for you guess what it would be a form of treatment but do you know what it's not. Mm-hmm. It's not a form of treatment. Yes, well done. Congratulations. You've identified what doesn't work for you. Congratulations. But has it solved your problems? If you're 15, 16, 17 years of doing the same shit over and over again, then trust me, it's not working. You need to look at what you can do to treat it. And, and I use the word treat openly because what works for other people doesn't work for others, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And I think, and I, I you know, I want to just change the tangent a bit because I remember... When when I've like popped on Instagram a couple of a couple of times, like I've seen some of your videos where you've been going through the migraine, and I've seen you like literally teared up, crying, going through it. Like that was a real powerful moment for me because that it, it showed me like like even when you're suffering, you can still share that suffering with other people. And I I think that for so many people has actually made them feel more empowered that they're not alone in, in this. And I think a lot of time with chronic diseases, we end up feeling alone, don't we? Mm. Well, even as you said, in terms of you can, it can be so isolating um, because you can't, you can get to this place where you're just trying to cut and cut and cut, you know, mm. like kind of remove everything that's triggering from your life, which mm. not only is really isolating, but it's also not fun. Mm. And as you were saying with kind of online, often there's lots of helpful tips out there, but no one's necessarily showing the reality of actually, you know, this is what it feels like when I'm 
at home alone and I'm having an attack and I'm feeling bad. You know, it's not me just kind of talking about all these great tips and things like that. You go through it as well. So I think it's a tricky one. Um, can you share some of your your particular triggers and how they evolved and maybe some of the things that uh, you feel helped to diffuse some of those triggers or I like is it is mm. are there some techniques or some medications or some things that you feel as you brought those into your life some of the triggers faded or what mm. was that journey like so as I was saying before, with chronic migraine, I got to a point where really, I said it all the time, like everything triggers my head. Yeah. Yeah. Things that were big for me though were stress, especially like big emotions. It could sometimes even be like happy emotions, but anything that was like big was like too much for my brain. My brain was so hypersensitive to everything, yeah. but especially like negative, or I don't even like to call them negative emotions anymore, but more difficult emotions, you know, getting angry, getting upset, which if you live with a chronic illness, you get angry and upset yeah. quite a lot. It's a lot of big uh, emotions. Yeah, it's yeah, a lot yeah, of big yeah. emotions. Um, yeah, poor sleep, stress, um, lights. Like I would not have been able to sit in here when I had chronic migraine. It's a lot of lights, isn't it's, it? Yeah. And actually, like, the lights they're, not bo- <laughs> they're not bothering me at all. Like, yeah. they're actually fine. Um, I became very, very noise sensitive, which I feel like everyone focuses on light sensitivity. That's, like, not the trendy trigger, but, like, that's the one people yeah. think of. My noise sensitivity got so bad that I used to have to not only eat meals on my own, like away from other people because I found the noise of cutlery too bad. I had to eat my own meals wearing earplugs because the noise of my own cutlery and eating was so severe. Yeah, I look back at Amy then and I'm like, but it also didn't help the situation, right? You became more and more sensitive to sound by like putting yourself in that position, by wearing sunglasses inside. It does become a vicious cycle, but it's still to kind of shine a light of how debilitating these not only triggers but then they become symptoms too Mm. of migraine um but if you are in a place where you are you know wearing sunglasses indoors you are wearing earplugs all the time or more times than not it seems really scary to like break free from that but actually it it only feeds the cycle your brain just learns that oh we need to like get in this cocoon and be safe and it doesn't it doesn't help you when you go out into outside and there's noise it doesn't help your brain um and I've forgotten your question again. What was your question about what triggers? Yeah, so just the triggers that you experienced and then what kind of changed in order to kind I mean, of to dissolve honest, some of those triggers because you mentioned that you don't struggle with all the same triggers now that you did in the beginning. Yeah, so there's kind of two main ways I would say that I overcame them, but also people in general can overcome their triggers. Mm. One is by raising your overall migraine threshold, so reducing the water in the glass like yeah. we talked about before. Or like and the histamine bucket. Yeah, or the histamine bucket. Yeah. And I would say medications, when I found a preventive medication that worked for me, it did help a little bit with this. So I was just slightly... Or not actually a little bit, a lot. And in combination with doing some lifestyle stuff and building a toolkit of items that actually worked for me rather than what everyone else tells you to use on the yeah, internet. Yeah. So that did help with something. So I was able to start tolerating screens again. Um, that's when I was able to start doing some volunteer work and little bits of work pieces, very small, and just be slightly more functional, I would say, day to day. Not everything I did gave me an attack. But the main thing that has helped me really overcome, and I call it overcome now, hence I'm sitting here and I'm going to drive home later and be fine, is brain retraining. And it's such a buzz term, buzzword at the moment. I'm seeing it more and more, which excites me. But I also, I think people dismiss it very quickly because it's like, what? Brain retraining? But that's truly the thing that's helped me to overcome so many of my triggers my brain was interpreting all these different things as dangerous before and signaling pain essentially or triggering off migraine attacks because of them. And I have, by using a various different techniques, retrained my brain to see these things as safe. And now, because they are safe, bright lights aren't inherently dangerous. Wind isn't inherently dangerous, but my brain, my migraine brain, who's like, ah, the world is dangerous it's like oh quick keep Amy safe I'm going to fire off a migraine attack yet you can retrain your brain 
to realize, oh, all these things are actually fine. They don't have to give you a migraine attack. That's interesting. Can I ask, how did it feel like when you've done like your Instagram recordings where you've been going through a migraine attack, how did you feel like in that moment when you were recording? Like, because you've, you've literally recorded yourself like crying in, in that emotional state. Did you find that the emotion, like crying and letting the emotion out, did you find it helped and supported in that moment? No, because at the time, crying, I would always try to avoid crying because it would always set off my head. It would always make my head worse. And mm. honestly, like the biggest breakthrough moment for me with triggers was being able to cry. And when I was doing the brain retraining, I actually had some really challenging stuff going on in my personal life. I was crying a lot mm. and I was like, I'm crying. I can be sad and cry and not get a migraine attack. Like this is insane. It sounds like a really big, like weird win to have, but to be able to cry, feel my emotions, but in a place where my nervous system is actually regulated and it's not just like sending panic to my brain was huge. Um, the videos I used to share of me crying always came from that point you were talking about earlier of like all these people who are in bed alone, they have no idea that actually so many other people, one in seven people, someone just down the road from them, someone at work, one of their colleagues, a friend, that every so many people are suffering, yet when you're alone in your bed, in the dark, in an attack, it feels like you're the only person in the world. So mm. as much as even if I rewatch those videos now, it like hurts me and I'm also like, how did I put this on the internet? I'm so glad I did because mm. someone else watching was like, oh, someone else truly gets it and has helped them to not feel alone. Do you know what, T? That that brain retraining, you know what it made me think of? You know, like, you know, like, I don't know if sounds daft, right? I'm going to caveat here. You know, the kids that watch, like, the really, like, intense TV programs, mm. like the ones where they, they switch every, you heard about it, it's like this three second rule. So, like, so, you know, like, we have, we've, like, adults now, we've lost our attention span. Oh, yeah, we're terrible. And so we have to retrain our brains because so many people aren't reading books anymore. Yeah. They're actually, they're actually watching or things. Or they aren't watching movies even. Yeah, because you can't watch <laughs> movies anymore because they're literally, like, scrolling on their phone. And it made me think, because that's what the brain retraining actually is, to actually learn to have an intention span again. And they're doing it with kids now, which is which is like... But that is brain retraining. Mm. And it's using kind of our understanding of how the brain works and how malleable and trainable the brain is. But it's using it against us in the sense of creating those videos that are really short and sharp and constantly have moving things to train our brain to not be able to tolerate kind of long form, more boring, slow content. And it's the same thing you're talking about, but applied, you know, in a beneficial yeah, way yeah. of, so of where you're training mm. your brain to be less hypersensitive because, mm -hmm. you know, our body it in a way like all of our bodies are the same in terms of like, you know, the network of being a human, how it kind of signals danger and how, you know, we protect from, you know, harmful invaders. Da, da, da. But so it's the same in terms of the network. But obviously, depending on all of these different environmental and physiological factors, our bodies can grow up to kind of respond in a different way. And I think like what you were saying, you're your body and your brain was like hypersensitive mm -hmm. and telling itself that, you know, things that aren't technically dangerous, like a, a bit of light were dangerous. Your body was saying this is dangerous. There's something going on signaling pain, which is our body's way of telling us yeah. get, you're in danger, get away. Mm -hmm. And so in that positive way, you you had to retrain it and tell your brain, no, no, no. It's not. It's okay. You don't need to send me yeah. pain. It's okay. Is that kind of the yeah, type exactly of that. I always, um, I mean, I explain it to people now, but I also used to think of it myself as if you're like retraining a muscle, but your brain mm. is a muscle. So if you yeah. think of the neural pathways in your brain, it's a bit like the muscles in your body. The more you use them, the stronger they become. And in the case of migraine, but also so many cases of chronic pain, not only is your brain sending these these signals it's like a false alarm essentially yeah. when you stub your toe your brain sends a signal to your toe and then back again to say ouch I'm in pain you hurt yourself in most cases of chronic pain with primary pain like which migraine is 
it's a false alarm. There's no there's no danger from that light, but your brain's like, uh, 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 <laughs> something's going wrong. Um, and it's almost like the the pathways in your brain get a bit too good. They've learned these mm. pathways so yeah. that it used to be, I just look at the light and boom, my brain's already made that connection, I'm in danger. And when you teach it something new, and it is like training a muscle, slowly over time, it learns like, okay, I look there and there's a different outcome. It's a bright light, oh, it's very bright, rather than you're having a migraine attack. And it's that repetition over time um, there are so many uses of it. I mean, people do it through visualization, but they're the kind of endless possibility with the fact that your brain is neuroplastic, which means it can change, are huge. Um, anyone who is, I would say, listening and is like, this is nuts, what is she talking about? The best example, and this is how I first talked to my dad about it, who I knew would be like, Amy, <laughs> you've lost your mind. <laughs> like, this is going on. Because it sounds woo woo, right? It yeah, sounds yeah. weird but it's based on neuroscience, is think of stroke patients. This is exactly how in the medical setting, not weird at all, we retrain stroke patients to use their arms again, use their feet again, motor skills through neuroplasticity, through retraining the brain to do certain movements again. It's exactly the same process. You know what, you know what I'm trying at the moment? Quite, actually quite funny, just talking about it. I'm trying to train my subconscious mind at the moment. So I'm doing a lot of, uh, just like add to what you're saying, right? I watched um, a video of a chap. I forgot his name now. I'll, I'll find the video and I'll link it in the description. He was talking about to talk to your subconscious brain. If you're, wh whatever, whichever part of your body, you're, you know your dominant hand, so you're like your dominant right hand, for example. He said, brush your teeth with your non-dominant hand and mm -hmm. stare into a mirror. So you start talking to yourself and I've just started doing it to see like if I can actually have a conversation with my subconscious mind. Mm. Doing it like three days. Damn. There's toothpaste everywhere. <laughs> no, but it's, uh, probably, there's toothpaste anyway. If anyone knows me, it's toothpaste anywhere anyway. But, but I was like, damn, like you can literally have a connection with your subconscious mind. And I'm trying to teach myself uh, new things like with thinking like, you know, how you go yeah. through a thought process. It works. So it takes 10, 10 15 seconds, just literally to his left hand and I'm like thinking about something and I'm like okay I want to do this today I want to become more focused I've actually become more focused and so to train your subconscious mind is very very possible mm -hmm. but the fact that it's not talked about it's like seen as woo, -woo medicine isn't it have you read breaking the habit of being yourself no. no, Dr. Joe Dispenza, he talks a lot about yeah, that. He talks okay. about doing things Jeff's like sleeping yeah. on the opposite side of the bed and a lot about your morning routine. Like we're so on autopilot, everything we do, especially in the morning. You're, I can't remember what it is, but you're, the brain waves in first thing in the morning are like different from... I'm hashing it, but a different mm. from like later on in the day. And he talks about doing things like in a different order or a different hand. Um, yeah, I highly recommend the mm. book. Because I think we, I think traditionally we're almost raised to believe that, you know, you kind of are what you are and, um, you know, things are more rigid and fixed. Whereas now we're understanding that actually, you know, particularly even kind of later in life, because there's always been this idea of, oh, kids, they're so malleable. They learn so quickly, you know, they're you know, they, they grow and they can change and they can adapt and learn new skills. But once you reach a certain age, like you're screwed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think now we're learning that actually, you know, the brain is uh, neuroplastic and there's so many things, whether you're trying to support a chronic illness, like in your case, or whether you're literally trying to improve a skill, like in your in your case where you want to improve focus there's so many different techniques that are along this line that yeah. you can you can apply and that's so encouraging because i know i think you you mentioned stroke patients i think of you know it's a big thing in dementia um yeah. prevention at the moment or or treatment and things to work on that neuroplasticity and it's so encouraging to have this thing that you know might sound a little bit woo woo but again you know research it look it up um yeah. it's very much embedded in neuroscience um i to, think to as have. well it's when i first started talking about it on my page i was really like hesitant because so many people and i've heard you guys even talk about this on the podcast before but they become so attached to their diagnosis and i did this myself it was so part of my identity 
And because it's migraine and because it's this neurological disease and because it's this and there's no cure, da, 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 like there's nothing I can do. And like there's no treatment. Da, da, da. Like it becomes so fixed. And when someone comes along and says, oh, but you can retrain your brain, you can overcome your triggers. People are like, what? Who is who is this girl? <laughs> and also, are you telling me the pain's all in my head? And I'm like, well, kind of, because all your pain is great in the brain, but not but not in the sense that you're interpreting. So it's it's a really difficult conversation. And I feel like I'm a bit of a an oddball almost in the migraine space to be so passionate about both sides. Like I am all for people having Botox. I'm all for supplements. I'm all for the lifestyle, but I'm also all for the mindset work and brain retraining. And it took me so long to get there, mm. but it was like, has completely changed my life. And now watching it change other people's lives just like blows my mind. But I think it's almost a bit odd within the migraine space to be so into both because people tend to go down very much like it's all mind body, it's all this, or it's all, it's a genetic neurological disease. And we only got to give you pharmaceuticals and actually I'm like the only thing that matters is that you start to feel better like that's the only thing that matters and if you need a bit of this and a bit of that or one or the other or a combination like that's that's fine and that's kind of the way forward but I do think the diagnosis and identity actually stops people from exploring some of these other options even from a supplement point of view which I'm like that's not woo woo or weird yeah. at all that's just like that's just like common like, sense you think this is alternative yes, trust I, I see it as like a spectrum with with yeah. the brain retraining being on the other end um but sorry the point I was trying to make is when I first started talking about it I was actually amazed at how kind of open the migraine community were because I was really expecting people not to be and there have been people of course who don't understand and that's fine um, or it's not for them but most people have been really open and are just like willing to learn and yeah it really impressed me I think it's also a compliment to my community because they are receptive and but I think also a compliment to you as well because I I was saying to Dilly I'm so impressed by how you can maintain such a balanced view, particularly when you're putting yourself out there in that space. Because, you know, I I know something that um, I often feel guilty about or, you know, struggle with is being a, a chronic sufferer myself in a particular thing and working in the health space and having worked through it myself. I don't... I don't think I have the ability to go out and talk about it because of that association with okay. the disease itself. Because yeah. I really, it pulls me back into that space, that strong association. So I look at someone like you and I just think that is so impressive that you're able to, you know, put yourself out there and talk about that diagnosis and have a certain identification there, but still create enough separation between yourself and that diagnosis to be able to kind of improve and share the the depth of of things that can help. Mm -hmm. I find that so impressive because I think over over I think diagnostics are really important and particularly when you're in a place that you're really struggling, it can really help to be like, oh, I See, I told you there is something yeah. wrong with me, but I think, and I don't know if this is what you experience, but I think often you find that you're fighting for that diagnosis because you want to, you want to be acknowledged mm -hmm. and you know someone to say, oh, you're not crazy, like this yeah. is a thing. But then I think sometimes you build that diagnosis up so much that that's once you get that everything will be okay. But actually, you realize that once you get that, you know, there's there's so much more in the journey. Um, so I find that really impressive and I'm sure that's how you've attracted such a balanced community as well. And just kind of not to go off on a tangent, but before I forget to, to add to what you said, because I think there's definitely and I see it all the time, there's definitely, you know, there's the groups of people that are quite rigid in the allopathic medical model. Um, but there's equally people, I think, that are very rigid yeah. in the kind of alternative mm. model. And, you know, we talk about this all the time. I think often I come from a functional background. Um, so I think often people assume that you're firmly in the alternative side. But I actually think the reality of the situation is that, you know, for most cases, 
pieces of each are, you know, you need parts Mm -hmm. of both puzzles and that it isn't a negative to kind of require little elements. There's a reason these spaces exist. And I think often, you know, the allopathic side can be very helpful in the initial stages when you talk about the real over hypersensitivity that we see in a lot of these chronic cases. You need that kind of bull I always call like kind of um medications kind of the bulldozers you need that bulldozer to go in and hit it but as we were saying with the Botox you know it it's often the case that with a medication it can help but the minute you come off that medication or Mm -hmm. if you've been on it long term then all of a sudden it stops helping and if you haven't looked at the alternative side of things you can find yourself in a difficult space and then on the flip side if you're in that over hypersensitive space everything feels like it's falling apart I think it's a lot of pressure and expectation to say to someone well what you need is to change your diet or what you need is to start exercising or start mindfulness Mm -hmm. and or like brain retraining and yes we know that that is the thing we know that it's important but to tell someone that right now in that space isn't helpful it's like Mm -hmm. saying well just stop feeling stressed because stress is a trigger (laughs) like you just want to you're like oh thanks so much for the great advice because I think about that and I I feel for doctors often as well in this space because to try and communicate to someone that is suffering deeply that there could be a psychosomatic element like you do kind of want to punch that person in the face you know they're trying to help but you're like I actually want to punch you right now so I'm I'm interested how you like where did you come (laughs) across the brain retraining bit and you know how did you receive that because obviously you're at this place now that you're talking about the benefits but I can imagine it wasn't always the case I think I agree with so much of what you just said because (laughs) I'm a really perfect example of that if I hadn't got to a point in my own recovery where I was still chronic, but I had some level of control, I'd got down from 20 plus attack days a month with daily head pain to 10 attack days a month mm-hmm. through the lifestyle changes and through medication, I don't think I would have been able to engage with the brain retraining and and actually some of the other lifestyle changes I then went on to do. And this is what I see all the time. And it sometimes is the flip. It's sometimes people get that control not through allopathic medicine but quite often it's they need if they're really struggling some kind of treatment first to just increase the threshold bring everything down calm it down a little bit so that they can even engage in like you say exercise just go for a walk walking can help so much or exercise but if you have no control of your migraine attacks it's like like you say okay I'll just go for some walks and (laughs) So it it does really help. And that's really why I believe the combination is so important. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I would have had a very similar reaction to I think what a lot of people probably have online. If when they see me talking about it, they don't know about me. And like this girl has lost her mind. What's she talking about? She's telling me it's all in her head. If someone had talked to me about brain retraining in between, I think, 2015 to 2018, despite the fact that I have a psychology degree and like I appreciate the way the brain works, I had no concept of how pain works. I had no real concept of brain retraining. And I think I would have been like, unfollow this girl. <laughs> like I just wouldn't have been interested. But I think it's really important to say that because I, I would have been that person too. Um, I first kind of was drawn into this whole world um, by the Migraine World Summit. And in a way that's still not quite spoken about in the Migraine World Summit, but doctors started talking about something called central sensitization. And my little ears were like, sorry, what? Like, this is a new phrase I haven't heard before. And it's used in the medical field. It's kind of, this is what kind of angers me so much that the medical field talk about it. They know they exist, yet doctors aren't really telling their patients about brain retraining or like how the two come together. But central sensitization is essentially where your brain learns to stay in pain because of those neural pathways. It needs less and less to trigger off an attack. And I remember this headache specialist talking on the summer, explaining what central sensitization was and also kind of giving the example of if it feels like everything is triggering off a migraine attack, it's probably not all these things. It's more your brain. And I'm like, 
that's me. <laughs> like, this is what I have. Um, and it was really this like light bulb moment for me of like, something is going wrong in like the circuits of my brain. It's not all these things are triggering off attack. It is, but it's like my brain responding. Yeah. And I had this knowledge of central sensitization for probably like two years before I actually really figured out what to do about it. And I was obviously reading because I'm a migraine nerd, <laughs> was looking at the research, but I couldn't understand like the how, like how do I do something about this for myself? Um, and again, I was still struggling with migraine. I was still going through the different treatments. There's only so many, so much energy you have to kind of put into these things. And I was looking into, well, I was actually also at this time exploring people like Dr. Joe Dispenza. I was exploring the nervous system and the vagus nerve and all these things that are kind of related, but not quite what I needed to be doing. Um, and I also had a really good cardiologist at the time for when I was diagnosed with POTS, who was to me like the best doctor I've ever seen because he was like fully on board with like the medication. He was fully on board of like the lifestyle hydration. So, but he was also like, have you tried meditation? <laughs> have you tried, have you tried like this certain type of breathing that's gonna like stimulate your vagus nerve? I'm like, this is, you're the you're, doctor for you're me. You're winning. You're yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it was gradual, it wasn't like an overnight thing. And then it was just by chance, really, I'd been looking at some different programs online and I was about to book onto one. And then a company called Lynn Health in the US actually reached out to me and said, we do this brain retraining. Um, it's only for people in the US, but you're in the UK. That's fine. <laughs> like, would you like to give it a go? And I was like, yes, please. This is like what I've been looking for. And it was incredible. I had the best coach so you have a program to follow which is largely educational base most of which I already knew because I'd been doing so much of it myself and exploring it on apps and podcasts and books and things um, but I really needed the actual help of someone one-on-one -on -one to kind of help apply it to me and some of the techniques that I thought um, a big technique of part of it's called pain reprocessing therapy is called somatic tracking and I thought like I've been somatic tracking for months nothing's changing and I'd been doing it all wrong like completely wrong and that's why I hadn't been doing any better and I needed that one-on-one -on -one support and guidance um, and within a few months like really quickly I saw huge differences I really overcame a lot of fear which was driving a lot of my attacks um and like I really went for in about three to six months from 10 migraine attack days a month with daily head pain to having like one attack a month two attacks a month like really low level um I still had daily head pain for a long long time but the when you're not having the attacks, you don't have then the fear that your daily head pain is going to build into attack. Um, and then I stopped working with my coach. I continued working on it myself. Um, I feel like I still work on it, but it's become so part of how my brain automatically works now because I have retrained it so that when certain things come up, like if I have a stressful phone call or something happens, my brain automatically responds in a different way now from how it did before not only from okay it doesn't automatically trigger off a migraine attack um but it just I don't know it's hard to explain it just I respond to things differently and beyond migraine and having pain which was obviously the reason to do it I also just believe I'm now a better person mm. for it like in every aspect of my life um like my relationships I think are better um I'm just happier generally, like day to day. Obviously, it's like you don't have chronic pain anymore. You're going to be happier. Yeah. But I've been well, feeling well and in remission from chronic migraine for a long time now. And my ability to deal with life and life stresses, I think, has it's like a, a really ongoing um, positive that's come out of the brain retraining and learning how to regulate my nervous system. You know what's funny, right? Is like you talk about like the brain retraining and the like. It, 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 if you if you were in the allopathic medicine like hardcore, you'd be like this person's nuts. What the hell are they talking about? Yeah. But do you know that do you know like the you we've probably all heard of the book like the law of attraction. 
and like energy and like how you attract things right and i think it's it's now it's like starting to really hit its peak in terms of like growth well they've started grounding it in neuroscience yeah. as well they've put that connection together which helps like grounding yeah. like kind of floor like you know we talked when we did our conversation with dr tina pierce like her talking about like doing grounding techniques and like looking at the arc machine and it's funny because like i even say like if you're in a trauma space and you're in this space of just like reactionary and everything's like, you know, like the smallest thing could be like completely blown out of proportion. And you know, everyone listen to this, you know someone in your life who's like, you know, th they could spill the coffee on the floor and they're like, oh my God, my world yeah. is completely destroyed mm -hmm. today. That can be retrained. But then yeah. you, if you're that person, you are going to attract people like that in your life and you're going to look at every single situation as a negative situation because you're in that negative mindset. And it's like, I, when, it, when the chronic disease space that we've, like talking the chronic disease space, and I am thinking of something specific, but I'm not going to say it because I'll probably get my ass handed to me. But I've got, well, there's certain people that I've met where they're in this chronic trauma space and I can't be around them. I literally just cannot be around them because I'm like, are you actually trying to help yourself mm. or are you trying to like destroy yourself? Because you're in this process where they're constantly getting unwell. They're constantly getting new things, new diagnoses. And you're just like, like, are you well? Like you're literally watching your body and your physical deteriorate, but not just you, your loved ones around you have to watch that. Like your loved ones around you actually have to watch you destroy yourself. And I think you people don't realize like how much what they do and how they behave impacts other people yeah. and it hits in the migrant community because the thing is living with migraine you know yourself is stressful but being the person who hasn't got migraine and you're living with that person is stressful because and i caveat to this like to children because one of the big things that we've started to get a lot of people talking about is young kids with migraines and young children being having chronic migraine days and for the parent it's stressful and so, like, how do they deal with it? How do they handle their children? And you've you, and you've said to me recently as well, like, you're getting a lot more parents talking to you about their kids having migraines, and they're they're in a trauma response. They're actually being taught that trauma area, like, from a young age. Mm -hmm. And so, we have to retrain even the kids to come out of that chronic pain. So, like, le like, can can we move to a bit more like children migraine? Yeah, domain? one thing I'd like to say on that is it it's so hard because I completely agree with what you're saying, but when you're in that space, yeah. it's it's so difficult. Like the people in that space, I still believe, even the ones who I would love to like, <laughs> come, let me help you. They're not in the, sp the head space to, to hear that or to act on that. But it's also not their fault. They're, they're oh, well, in that yeah, space yeah. for a reason. Yeah. Um, and I kind of just want to acknowledge that because I, I'm so aware of, the privilege I now have in a place mm. of remission but I'm also aware that even when I was having 20 plus attack days a month and daily head pain for years and years and years I still wasn't like that I was still a person who was like well, I'm gonna get better I'm gonna find a way and I do think that that mindset piece is like the key and some people seem to to have it or not for whatever reason um but I'm always kind of thinking about how to speak to that person and whether almost I should be speaking to that person or is it kind of not a waste of time but like kind of because they're, they're never going to hear what I'm saying in a way that's actually going to help them um, and that's something I really struggle with because when you talk online and you speak to people at all different <laughs> places of where they're at um, it's very hard and I know when I you know sharing my message and the way I speak online does kind of attract the people who are looking for answers who want to get better and everything but it's also talking to people who are feeling stuck who are in that place of like nothing can help me and I probably annoy the hell out of them a lot of the time even before I was better but I'm I kind of often think about that how best to still be there for those people and help them in some way to kind of move out of this place um but I acknowledge mm. how how hard it is and people reach out to me even which I it's my favorite message to get yeah. where someone other than I've recovered or I've done this and whatever um where like I unfollowed you for a bit because I was like I didn't like when you shared about this or when you talk it's often the brain retraining stuff but actually something kind of something Russell you know like got to me and now I've done this and I'm better or now I've done this and like I just want to say thank you and sometimes I think it is putting yourself out there and saying the things that <coughs> people might not want to hear but 
actually is what they need to hear. But can I say, like, you attract what you put out, like you put out. And I'm like, just to go, my little rant wasn't about having to go at anyone. It's more so, like, I know where those people have been because I've been there. Yeah. I've been there many, many times. Like, we talk about it on our on our podcast quite a bit, like, from depression to you yeah. name it. And it's not having to go, go at those people because I, I completely understand when you're not in that position to want to change or make that change because you don't know how to make that change. Yeah. Like, life comes in peaks and troughs. You're going to have these troughs and you have these up days and down days. There's no such thing as li- like health being linear. Because if health was linear or life was linear, damn, we'd all be winning, right? Yeah. But I always say to people, you're allowed to have a shit day. You're allowed to have a sad day. You're allowed to have a migraine. It's, you're allowed those. You have the full privilege to have those. But remember, it can always get better as well. And it can always get worse. <laughs> yeah. But you can get to that, that stage of it. I think that, I mean... I want to say, I think the chronic illness stage is a really tricky one because when you're in it, it can just feel like the whole world is crumbling on top of you and you're so symptomatic. And, you know, particularly that place we were talking about where you just feel like everything's triggering you, like even the, you know, strongest, most supported, you know, most well-equipped person In that situation, I think, um, you know, to hear something like, well, it's it's in your head or it's up to you or, you know, you're attracting this. I just think like, no, I I can't hear that go away because it's not that like because what you're saying is is true and correct in a way. But then also being in it and feeling completely helpless is also true and correct Mm. and I think I wonder you know I think there's definitely a character piece to what you were saying um you know having that mindset because we've both had chronic illness you know things of our own and but also had that kind of mindset but then (laughs) (laughs) but then I wonder how much you know is also environment because take it back to what we were talking about you know you you were very lucky in the sense of having um medical staff and obviously you worked really hard for it and you you fought as well i was i feel so privileged like i lived in southwest london yeah of all had like parents to support me financially as i like i am yeah. really aware of my privilege and had access to headache specialists yes I've worked blooming hard to get where I am but so many people do not have these things to fall back mm. on or they don't live in the right area or the right country or whatever and I think the language as well because there's something it might seem silly but there's something very powerful about having a doctor, a cardiologist, you know, these people that we put on a pedestal in terms of you're the one that's going to give me my solution with something medical, to have someone in that position say to you or even acknowledge that the lifestyle things that you were doing could make a difference is so powerful. And I think that in and of itself is something that a lot of people that maybe might still be very deep in that suffering space are. Because I even think about the fact of, because, you know, I so relate to being in that place where, honestly, I thought anyone talking about getting better was a dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's how, no, I, yeah, it I sounds it. Yeah, terrible. Yeah. And I'm probably that person now for so many people. But, the, like, I think back to that space. And I remember, um, as I said, kind of nerve, chronic nerve pain, um was was my challenge and I think about the language that a lot of people around me would say they were like wow Tracy your pain threshold is so high Mm. because you're always in pain but actually what we were talking about with this hypersensitivity technically you could argue that someone that chronically suffers from pain actually their threshold is really low because they have that hypersensitivity that their body's reacting to pain and everything. But if you imagine kind of living in pain and having everyone around you trying to support you, because everyone, I think, often has the best of intentions and they're trying to support you by saying, wow, you're so strong. You know, you must have such a high pain threshold to go through that. But 
how much even that messaging could block you from finding the solution of, you know, brain retraining or, you know, nervous system retraining, which is trying to increase your threshold yeah. because you become so hypersensitive that your pain is signaling is over oversensitive or overreactive. And just even in that small way, how that in itself can push you into this place of feeling stuck. Because I remember when we were talking, we actually got introduced you introduced you through Cephaly. Did you? Yeah, so Cephaly, like I remember, because we went to a talk. With they're just the, down the road from us. Yeah, me. yeah, they're down far. the road from us. So the migraine, when the migraine oh, action... Oh, is that the thing that the you device, wear? Yeah, the device that I wear, yeah. I was just thinking, I was like, is that someone's Do you like name? It? Is that... I'm I'm a big fan of it. I think I, I did find a benefit from it. Um, I used to use it when I was like quite stressed out. But I think what I found was like I'm I'm hyperactive. Like if you if you if you didn't realize I do a lot of hand gestures and the way I talk and I go from like really loud and being hyperactive. I like trying to con calm my brain is very very tough mm -hmm. and like people think sometimes it's stress. It's not. Sometimes my brain is just going for yeah. reasons reasons unknown to me. And what I found with Cephaly was when I put it on, I could, I'd put it on and for that 15 minutes that the, the, it was going for that process, I would just allow my brain to feel like that, feel that tingling mm -hmm. sensation on my brain. And it, I think it allowed me to kind of like take control of that moment and not think, if you know yeah. what I mean? And that's how I found it, how it benefit, benefited me. But when I listened to like their research and I read through the research about like raising the pain threshold, that's mm -hmm. what the device is for it. But then I've had really mixed reviews. Some people really like it, but then some people just don't like it at all. It's like everything, right? Mm. Like some people love it. Um, I've worked with Cephaly for a number of years. So like full disclosure, anything I'm about to say. Yeah. But I used it personally myself. Um, again, learned about it at the Migraine World Summit. Shout out to the Migraine World Summit for learning yeah. about all these things. Key takeaway. And it was really initially to try as a preventative. So there's a preventative setting, which is 20 minutes, and there's now an hour long. I don't know which version you have, but the acute version for when you have an attack is an hour long. You don't have to use it for the whole hour as well, but you should. <laughs> That's what the research mm. suggests you should use. Um, and it didn't work for me as a preventative. And I was really disappointed because mm. I was like, I need a preventative. And yeah, I was really struggling with the kind of more traditional oral preventative medications that my doctor was giving me. But as an acute treatment, I loved it. It made such a difference, especially when I was more severe chronic. Um, because there's only a certain amount of days of the month that you are allowed to take pain medication because otherwise you run into risk of medication adaptation headache or making things worse. And the more you take acute medication actually over that threshold, the less effective it becomes. And Cephaly was an incredible tool in my toolkit for treating attacks where I didn't always have to take my acute medication. So sometimes I would just be able to use Cephaly on its own. A lot of the time I use Cephaly in conjunction with my medication. Sometimes I just use medication. But when I was really bad, almost daily, because I was having such frequent attacks, at around four or five o'clock was when, I don't want it like witching hour, but <laughs> very different. But that's when my symptoms would start to get worse. It would build through the day. And if I hadn't, if I didn't use Cephaly, I would then be like completely disabled for the rest of the day. I'd be out of action, unable to do anything. But if I did an hour of Cephaly, and I think it's twofold. One is just like taking the time out. Your brain isn't focusing on anything else. Mm. You're lying still. I would try and either do like some deep breathing with it or listen to an audio book or something like calming for my system. Um, I would then usually be functional again. And it really was the difference of, and it, it's not about being at that point pain-free or symptom-free. It was really like, functional can I sit and eat dinner with my family or like whatever else was going on um so yeah I I loved it um and from working with them and getting to speak to so many of their customers and also through my own page for some people the difference not only Cephaly but devices in general make are life-changing mm. it's the same as supplements um for most people I think it's this combination approach that we've spoken about but it I mean Hearing people do well on medications is one thing and it's exciting. But sometimes when people are like, I've done Cephaly for two months or I've taken Dolivant for two months and I've gone from this number of attack days a month down to this, I'm like, 
wow, like this is mm. incredible. And the preventative setting on on Cephaly, that's the one I hear the most about where people have had this like life changing experience just from adding in a device where there's no real side effects. It's totally safe. They can use it as often as they like. I'm like, what's not to love? Mm. <laughs> like it's mm. it's incredible. I think yeah, that's sorry. why it's really n- sorry, Ginger. I I just I think that's why it's so important to talk about these kind of adjunctive supports yeah. because, as we were saying earlier, I am absolutely one that thinks medication is fantastic when you need it but medication was never created to be a long-term thing that's why if you actually read the insert leaflet you see about 20 million side effects yeah don't ever read the leaflet inside any any medication but then like even if you look at your medication you know often there's only a handful that you're on for treating the issue and then all the other ones are to mitigate the side effects from the original ones so (laughs) it's not supposed to be a long-term treatment and it Mm -hmm. can actually be very harmful so I think having these adjunctive um, things that work and can support like the devices like brain training like supplements obviously supplements is something we're passionate about is so powerful because it is something that you can have in your toolkit long term Mm -hmm. without the damaging effect um so can you talk a little bit you mentioned so you mentioned the brain retraining you've mentioned um the cephaly device i know obviously i mean i've only joined the the team so you met through dalavant which is a brain uh, a three-in-one brain supplement, brain honest. supplement. Yeah. Yeah. How did you? Were you already familiar with supplements before? Then do you take other supplements, or was it something that you heard through the grapevine? Because I know obviously a lot of neurologists use Dolivin to support migraine. So I knew about supplements before. Okay. I was taking them. I would say, but because I was taking them all individually. Okay. One of them I wasn't quite taking at the right dose and this kind of is like going to end up being a pitch but Dolivant but they would run out at different times you then get a bit like lazy with it it was I was taking so many medications as well at the time that it was just like more tablets mm-hmm. to take yeah. it's expensive. so it, it was you're expensive um, I was always then suddenly trying to find ones that actually you know you look on Amazon and you like look for the cheaper ones then you're like oh but what else is in this this is probably full of rubbish um, I was taking one that had very good marketing for migraine yeah actually had like I think about 50 grams of magnesium in and I'm like once you understand but you understand why people fall into all these traps there are so many I don't know, this is a whole podcast for another day yeah, yeah. but there are so many things being marketed to us constantly on social media that are just rubbish basically. be wary of really really good marketing yeah I always... oh, no. be wary of cheap products yeah. products that are really cheap as well oh yeah, yeah so once they really added in cheap. with them yeah i i often say i mean i shouldn't say this because we're obviously making a big effort with marketing because we used to be practitioner only and now we've worked really hard to bring things direct to consumer and we're working on marketing so hopefully we'll get better at it so I feel like I shouldn't say this but I, I'm always so conscious of even like you know clinicians who like market themselves so so well or products that are marketed so so well yeah. often they're not putting the effort into the research side yeah. or the research element so always read the label yeah <laughs> always ask questions so discovering Dolivant really was like oh this is going to make my life so much easier I'm going to get the doses that I need for migraine um all in one just easy and I think that can make your life easier and make sure you're actually taking it and I do Mm. think it helped me take it consistently Dolivant for me wasn't this like game-changing thing and it's actually been really eye-opening to me over the years and especially I think more recent times as we've been I've been talking about it more and we have been marketing Dolivant more that it can be though and that really excites me that supplements can be this thing because I think they're so often like an afterthought or like take them but they're not doing much and I think I thought that a bit for a time I was like I'm I'm, I'll do anything that can help Mm -hmm. and well like what we were saying uh kind of off camera as well about you know how amazing it is if you do get a doctor who might yeah. actually recommend a supplement but they're not trained in it so so often what happens is like you know you need to take vitamin d or magnesium but it's like 
oh, take 50 milligrams, which yeah. is no weird. It's not even going to touch it. Yeah. I always say, like, if you're taking supplements and you don't notice an immediate difference, talk to an expert because you're, it's, you are you aren't taking it right or you're taking the wrong thing because you should notice a difference. Yeah. You know, like, we talking, like, mentioning about Dolivant, one of the things that I've found a lot more is so many GPs now, the amount of GPs we're getting where they're, patient is coming in and their gps recommend it to them and the, the, the mm. patient's now taking it oh, great. and the gp's now saying to them well let me feedback what's going on i literally had a phone call last week with someone where the the, the patient had been taking dolivan and it didn't agree with that and we just stopped it yeah and do you know what she said to me she said dilly she's like i really wanted this to work but it didn't work for me mm. and i was and she goes but do you know what i just don't think my body's in the right place for it. Yeah. She said that. I didn't tell her to say that. She said it herself. She yeah. was like, I think I want to take it, but I want to take it in a couple of months' time when I'm in a different place. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, what works for someone isn't going to work for every single one. But if it doesn't work for you, that's okay as well. Yeah. Like, it doesn't mean it's bad. It means that your body just needs time to adjust. And Yeah, Dolivan Dora supplements aren't yeah. the migraine solution for no. everyone. Yeah. And even like you were saying, you know, you were a migraine sufferer that had less, you didn't really have as many you know, food triggers or we were talking about like histamine can be a big trigger for mm -hmm. a lot of people with migraine, but it wasn't for you. So it would make sense that, you know, certain things wouldn't work, but then the brain retraining worked yeah. really well. And so it's kind of like getting the information, but also, as you were saying, trusting yourself and trying to learn yeah. how you individually respond because just because something is you know this great product that lots of people who are suffering similarly to you yeah um it doesn't mean that that's what's right for you and i think that's what really drives my desire to to share everything i've learned with mm. people i know you said earlier you kind of almost find it surprising that I can do that and I'm not just like Impressive, focused on by the way. <laughs> talking about like the things for me but I'm so aware that it is different for everyone yes there's these common things that come up and you know if someone walked in right now and they're like I'm really struggling and be like well have you done this this and yeah. this and this and you probably start there's feeling foundation there's foundations yeah. but it does look different from everyone and that's why I'm like if I can share with as many different people as possible these common things that oh you know do help people time and time again. Um, and with the supplements, just going back to Dolivan, I would say the actual, genuinely, the only downside I hear is because it's a three-in-one, people then give up sometimes if it doesn't agree with them. Whereas in reality, it might just be they need to, you know, build up slightly slower or it might be, okay, their body can't tolerate the magnesium right now. And that's the only one that I find a bit like, oh, like you still need the coenzyme Q10 or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, you must hear a lot from customers, but if it's not agreeing, normally I feel like by reducing the dose and building up slowly tends to, to settle it, it things. It gets rid of it completely. Yeah. Because yeah. Often it's you're, reducing. Yeah, you're building, you, need to, you need to build bowel tolerability to it yeah. because it is an increased amount. And because it's such an increased amount of it, you are going to get the benefits, but you might just need to go to one, one capsule a day and then do one capsule twice a day. Yeah. But I, I don't know about you, one of the things I found, like with Dolivant for me, because I do take it, but I can't take more than two capsules because if I take it and I take it too close in the evening, I have the most mental yeah, you dreams. Told me this and, and people say to me, like, that's weird, I don't get that. But for some reason, it, it's something to do with the B vitamins and CoQ10. My brain just it's goes. It's the boom, hyperactivity boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Yeah. pathway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it, man. I think my brain's processing it efficiently. Like my caffeine. It's like I, I remember you telling me it, and I was like, What? I, yeah. I take it like ten o'clock at night. But I still take it right before bed and I don't I don't think I'm having wild dreams. Yeah. I'm fine. Yeah. I'm closer to you. But also we were saying about caffeine, you know, you're like, I could have, you know, yeah. caffeine before bed and sleep. Whereas you're someone that if you've, too much caffeine like you can you start shaking <laughs> and you can see it but I think but that's a really good example of how our bodies are Different. individual mm. and that how we might still need the same things but just at a slightly different way yeah. it's something that comes up a lot um, for vitamin D um, and I think as well of also acknowledging that a lot of people coming to this space are probably have layers of challenges and difficulties yeah. going on so it's not necessarily you're not coming it from like a foundation or a baseline so there's things that need to be worked through but I know vitamin d is something that comes off up quite often which for 
99.9% of people, they'll take vitamin D, they'll feel great, it'll be brilliant. But there are some people that they're so deficient on the cofactors. So cofactors being other nutrients that are required for the body to use this nutrient that they can take it and they can start getting all these different symptoms. And, you know, I think in society we've been kind of told, oh, that means I should write it off because it doesn't agree with me or I don't need it. But actually, in reality, it could be that you really, really need it. But you're so deficient in, say, magnesium, which is a cofactor for vitamin D, that your body literally cannot break Mm -hmm. it down and utilize it. You need to increase your magnesium Mm -hmm. first, like you were saying, if you know, sometimes you might need little bits of the individual elements in yeah. terms of it before building to the kind of whole element. It reminds me of using the magnesium spray because for a while I wasn't on taking magnesium because I was having um, basically daily diarrhea, let's be honest, mm-hmm. on one of the preventative medications. And there was like no way that adding magnesium into that situation was going to be good for anyone. <laughs> so I was doing like um, magnesium bath salts and I also bought the spray and nobody told me at the time that my legs were like on fire burning. So I was like, oh, I just can't tolerate the spray. And now I've learned through you, Dilly, that it's because I was so deficient in magnesium. And that's Therese why. Therese told me that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's 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 right. I, I tell you. him everything. Yeah. <laughs> But I had no, so, but at the time I was like, well, my body just, I clearly yeah. can't tolerate this. I'm going to find a different way. Um, but I, at the time I thought this is great. This is a, another good way for me to get some magnesium without it having to be absorbed through my gut. Yeah. Um, the other thing that just made me think of it when you were talking then, especially with side effects is so often I hear from people, especially with, you know, taking supplements and this happens too with medications, but it's amazing what we link in our brain to things so people might have you know taken Donovan day one morning and something has happened and because it's your first day your brain is like well it's definitely the supplement and linked it (laughs) and I always like to tell this story of the day I was meant to first take my anti-CGRP medication the very first one I ever took and the day I was meant to take it I had like a one-off 24-hour like stomach bug something and obviously then didn't take my anti-CGRP medication, took it like the next day. And I always think if I had taken it that morning, I would have been like, oh my goodness, I can't tolerate this medication. Like it's definitely this side effect. And it's not always that, especially if you're having migraine and you have gastrointestinal symptoms or whatever other side effects you're feeling, it might be maybe you're having a migraine attack that day. Maybe you're having some premonitory symptoms. Maybe it's your medication. Um, And just I always try and tell people to like, give things a bit of time, yeah. reduce the dose, build up slowly, discuss it obviously with your doctor. But if you take something one day and then suddenly it's quite unlikely with these things that you're going to have such a severe mm. reaction straight away. Particularly if it's like a relatively small amount as yeah. well. Like if you were taking like, if you took that whole box of medication, yeah. then probably you'd expect <laughs> yeah. something. But it's something I know I can, you can I, literally, see my <laughs> I literally can read your mind as you're talking because I'm thinking about we've had, we've gotten it several times where people have had a bout of food poisoning yeah. but it's coincided with them maybe taking the f- like taking the first dose of something yeah. and often like literally one dose is so you know small there's no way it could have that effect yeah. but because you like they have that the food poisoning they're like oh I, I'm intolerant I think something's happening but then it'll transpire oh no I just had a bad takeaway yeah <laughs> um, but it's trying I think particularly again in that space that a lot of these people struggling with chronic illness are in where you're just so reactive to everything Mm. even though I know the solution is to push through and keep trying you know continue the supplement or the device or the brain training or whatever it is even though we know that that's the path you need to take I also so empathize with people in that space where they're just hypersensitive to life really and I I so get that anxiety of like you know oh this is now a trigger and this is a trigger and just being so scared of anything and making anything worse as well like no one wants to feel any worse than they already do when they're in that position and I don't know how you get through to someone in that space or if it is truly 
kind of like in your story that you've shared and, you know, our experiences where you do just have to reach that point yourself in a way um, where you're like, OK, I ha- something's got to give. I've yeah. got to try something. And then maybe that helps a little bit and then you can try something else. I don't know if you have any advice or experience in that place of like how you know is there any way of breaking through in in that place I think a big part of it is patience and people aren't very good people (laughs) do want (laughs) they're not though people want an overnight quick fix like let's I'm gonna plug our Amazon effects video (laughs) we literally did a video last week about Amazon of the Amazon effect of health like where people want a I've got so much to listen to yeah I'm gonna gonna plug that video in because that's it's so true it is and I've even had people you know reach out to me about the brain retraining or doing my course and they're like I'm really interested but I'm sort of I'm not like they're not willing to put in the time and energy and they want to know it works. Yeah, they want to know it works. But even when if they had, I think the guarantee it works, like if you think about over here taking a pill, how easy that is. And that's why I actually am like the supplement is so easy. Like just take it. You're not there's no effort required all the way to kind of all of the lifestyle stuff, um, making changes, the energy and effort that requires and the time down to over here, which I think is actually the most labor intensive, Mm. the brain training, that people don't actually want to do it. And I mean, some people do, Mm. but people, I'm always amazed how many people even admit to me that like, I don't want to do that. I want to find a pill that like fixes it. Like I'm, and I get it, you're struggling, but I'm always like, if you knew this, this side of the things could make a big difference, like surely it's, it's worth spending the time and energy um in but lo- lots of people don't want to do that they do want to find something quick they're yeah. uncomfortable with being uncomfortable i was talking about the, the, just to go to the vitamin d side of things the reason why like i even bring up vitamin d is because we the problem with vitamin d is with migraine there is research on how it's linked to it by reducing the amount of calcium in the physical brain and a lot of people don't actually understand that you have vitamin D receptors in your brain. So your brain actually requires vitamin D for order to, to, to function. So the, the thing is, when we look at vitamin D, our kind of focus is always on rickets disease and osteoporosis. But vitamin D plays a more higher role in other functions and aspects of life. Well, it's if a hormone. It, it's a hormone. You so it's, it's in different parts of the system. It's not just in mm-hmm. muscles and tissues. And so when we look at vitamin D, because people, what people will say is like, when I say it's like the Amazon effect approach, well, they'll be like, and I, I take the piss. Oh, we, would, we were walking when we were talking yeah. about doing this podcast. I was like, oh, I like, I go, I go, I go Trace, I get these people but just like, oh, dearly, I don't need to take vitamin D. You know what I did? I was in the sun for two weeks in Greece. And I was, it's I, literally I, me. I, know, I was like, it's I got a little vitamin D for the winter. But that's what we're taught. Like, but to that's be what fair, we're taught. that's yeah. what we're taught. So I do understand why people have that thinking. Before I was re-educated, that's what I thought too. And then I, when, when I tell people, I'm like, you're chatting shit. Mm. And I was like, because I said to people, Right, this summer, I was sat behind my desk. I can, I can literally see my desk from here. At 12 o'clock, do you think I stopped at 12 o'clock and went, you know what, I need to go get my daily dose of vitamin D? No, I was working. I tell you what, go to your employer, enjoy the summer and say to them, hey, mate, do you mind if I just stop at 12 o'clock and go stand in the sun half an hour fully naked? <laughs> they look at you like you were crazy. So I say to people, but this is the problem. Like, we've been, we've been trained in these really... Like these methods, right? But these people aren't experts. Tell you what, go to a surgeon and ask him about cardiology. He's going to look at you like, what are you asking me for? Yeah. So why are you going to people who don't understand vitamin D and asking them the same question? It doesn't It doesn't make sense. Like, it, 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 it's too generalised. If we're going to general, like general medicine, that's a very different kettle of fish. And so to come back to vitamin D, like, everyone should be taking it. Because if you... And read the research... It's literally physically there in how it pulls calcium away from the brain and it utilizes it in the receptors. That's such an easy fix. And what does CGRP do? Oh, it, it blocks the receptor. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's the same thing. So you can actually use them in tandem and you'd feel the benefit not only of CGRP, but also the benefits come with vitamin D as well. And this is the thing with supplements and medications. What I love is the fact that you can use them in tandem. You can use them together and have the benefits of both. Mm-hmm. That's such a good example, actually, of what we we're saying in terms of the acute short term and then the long term. Because the thing with vitamin D is if you're really deficient, it'll take time to build back up your stores to get 
to the place where it can yeah. do that, Eventually, where it can yeah. pull the, the calcium. But obviously the drug will be able to immediately go and have that effect. So it's a lovely example of that synergy and why, you know, we should be talking about this more. Basically, if you're starting an anti-CGRP, you should start vitamin D. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> and, and like, get, literally just get tested. But yes. it's And the right amount of uh, vitamin D. Like, please, 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 the right quantity. Yeah. Um, um, and, it, and it's true. Like, it is such a, a basic thing. But I think, like, this whole topic of conversation that we've done, like, everything we've talked about is the fact that there's not just one method. And if someone's coming out of the door and saying well this method worked for me so it should work for everyone and i've seen it a lot in the you know like the the facebook group groups that people have where someone will come out the door and say guess what guys this worked for me so you should all try it yeah. that's a really wrong method to do because like what works or for this you, didn't work for me and yeah. so all these awful trash. things happened to me and trash mm. that's yeah. also what i see a lot of sadly and Facebook groups. <laughs> but also I hope for anyone listening with regards to migraine, because I feel like I've learned so much in terms of migraine specifically. And, you know, hopefully either for anyone suffering, it'll kind of give them that peace and acknowledgement that it is multifactorial. Mm -hmm. And hopefully for anyone who knows a migraine sufferer, maybe they'll be a little bit more understanding that, you know, it's not as simple as like this big headache that someone has yeah. a little bit that actually this is a multifactorial thing that can you know go on long term and there's loads of layers to it so you know that's really encouraging it is encouraging isn't yeah it? and it's been amazing having you here oh, thank nice. you so much mm, thanks for having thank me it's my favorite topic to talk about yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um if anyone wants to kind of reach out to you who finds this on youtube where can they go to kind of like connect with you and do your course? They can find me at um, The Migraine Life on Instagram. That's kind of the main place where I'm posting most days. Um, and if they are interested in doing the course, which is called Managing Migraine, Survive to Thrive. If you are basically struggling with migraine and want to learn about all of these different topics, essentially, it's kind of everything that I've learned over the last seven eight nine years now um put into one easy to follow place so you don't spend years like i did googling researching um it's all there in one place and you can also get ongoing support from me with any questions you have um that's also linked in my instagram page can i just say that like ongoing support from you is incredible um it's like having me in your back pocket. yeah <laughs> no, like, you know i'll say i'll say it and i say it with confidence if like to have you on the other side of it is is actually a privilege because even when I've had questions about migraine I've just pinged them across to you and asked you mm -hmm. and that is like your experience and your knowledge is just it, it's it's so needed in this community because you, I don't think I don't think you've realized the impact you've had on so many people and so it's a privilege having you today here and like honestly uh, I think there will be a lot of people if you have met with Amy or spoken with Amy please just leave some comments as as, as gratitude because share I think we love. should because yeah do <laughs> share some you. love because Amy thank you so much for for kind of like holding that baton for migraine sufferers <laughs> <laughs> you've, done, you've, you've done amazingly and honestly honestly mate like yeah. it's a it's a privilege the fact that you've managed to put so much content together and posting daily even when you were suffering yeah. and you've done it done it for so many it is not easy. And I'd like to add as well, and I promise then we will close this. I feel like <laughs> there's the Irish goodbye. This is like an Irish conclusion to video. But I would like to say to any practitioners that are listening who might um, either specialize in, in migraines or headache um, or, you know, see any patients that are suffering with it. I would really say go to Amy's page as a fantastic resource because I do think sometimes, you know, there can be a disconnect, even if you know everything, you know, physiologically and anatomically when it comes to headache and migraine sometimes there can be a little bit of a gap in terms of the best ways of communicating that to someone yeah. who's experiencing it on a day-to-day -day. and it's I've sent a few practitioners to your page because I think the way that you present um, the information and that experiential part you bring to it is just so informative and so beautiful that I think actually not just sufferers but also you know practitioners and doctors 
could really learn a lot from the way you're talking about this. So yeah, anyone listening, check out her page as well. It will be linked below as well as that device, the the brain training, the supplements, anything that we've mentioned, it'll all be linked below. Mm. Oh, and please do leave your tell us about your migraine journey. Yeah. That's one thing I will say. If anyone if anyone covered anything, this, yeah, let us know what you think of what we spoke about today. And like, we really do appreciate like people joining us today. So thank you so much, Amy. Yeah, thanks for having me. This has been great. Appreciate it. <laughs>